Hi Drama Llamas! Today we're going to be talking about our first unit in theater history and that is Greek theater. Let's get started, shall we? So we're going to be kind of talking about the origins of Greek theater, the physical stage, and what their plays look like. So before we get started, I wanted to give you some terms. The first two terms is amphitheater and dithyram. The amphitheater is an open, circular, or oval building with a central space surrounded by tiers of seating for spectators for the presentation of dramatic pieces. So amphitheater is going to come up later, and of course the dithyram. This is a wild choral hymn of ancient Greek, especially one dedicated to Dionysus. Usually it's a passionate or inflated speech poem or other writing. All right. Those are some starter terms. Let's get started on more learning more about Greek theater. All right, so the origins of Greek theater. The origins of Greek theater come from a religious background. So the Greeks were what we would call polytheistic. Poly meaning many, as opposed to mono, which means one. So most religions today are monotheistic, meaning one god. So opposite being poly, poly means many gods. So like Zeus, um, Athena, etc., um, Hades, all of these are the many different gods for different things. Now, theater was mainly done for the god Dionysus. Dionysus was a god of fertility and abundance and everything that you need to survive, which is like the fertility of the land, fertility of our of the humans to keep the Greek society going. So originally it was done very like religious reasons. We use that dithyram. It was like a story for Dionysus, told for Dionysus, maybe telling the story of Dionysus um, to help celebrate him to get favor for better crops and life. These were first performed on like the thrashing room floor, which was a circle where you would thrash wheat. Now then it eventually evolved into what we called the amphitheaters. And so that amphitheater is outdoors and it seats can seat up to 20,000 people. The, it was really important for a Greek society that you participated in religious things, which included going to the theater. So that's why amphitheaters were so big because you wanted to fit your whole uh, society or your whole city state into an amphitheater. So the parts of the theater, we have the theatron, which is the viewing place, which we eventually becomes the word theater, orchestra, which becomes or orchestra, but in the case of the Greeks, it was the dancing space. The parados are like pass passageways. I didn't say it's passageways. There's two passageways. If you think about it, if you like Spanish, parados, dos meaning two, so multiple. Then we had the proscenium, which is the front of the skein. So proscenium becomes proscenium that we were talked about in um, theater types of stages. But for us, it's the, like the front of the skein. And the skein was a tent or a building that could represent like a palace or a temple or whatever it needed to be for whatever production was going on. So skein becomes obviously the word scene. All right. So th we're looking at here now a picture of a Greek theater. So we're going to go over those those places and where they would look like. So remember, this is this amphitheater. You're outdoors. You got your performers coming in, and the audience sits in the theatron. So if you were the audience, you would come in and sit in the theatron. Now we would call it the house. So Greeks theatron now house. Then we have the orchestra. The dancing place that's where the majority of the performance would happen and we would just call it the stage now we also have now we have the orchestra pit but that is a different part of the stage but for this the dancing space or the main acting space is orchestra then we have our two passageways parados and the parados was a, where the audience came in, but also during the play, anybody coming from a foreign land would come from these perdos. Then we have the proscenium, that is the space in front of 
the like building structure that people they would do set and things like that but very minimal it's not like today where we have huge giant sets to create the world it was very simple back then and then the skiing which is this little building and they would hide stuff behind it or people could go the actors could go behind it when they're not on stage continuing on with the theater origins of the greek so, in the beginning, it was just a group of people performing as one, the like a chorus of people performing the stories of whatever. First was Dionysus and then evolved to more different commonly Greek stories. Well, what happened to make it more like actual drama we think today, we had the very first actor, whose name was Thespis, step out of the chorus and created a dialogue between himself or whatever character he's playing and the other character of the chorus eventually in the greek theater you would have three actors and a chorus now the three actors would play multiple parts so one actor could end up playing four or five parts and you're probably asking how did that happen well We'll get back to that in a second. Let me go back to the chorus. So the Greek chorus, as I said, it was the, that's where it all started off with. It was started off with the Greek chorus working and speaking and moving and doing things together to celebrate the gods. They, once Thespis stepped out, the Greek chorus kind of evolved. They become like a narrator or an ideal specter for the story that's going on on stage. They would give advice and comments and opinions. Usually the Greek chorus represented like the like people they would dance and sing and chant and whatever they were doing they did it in unison like they would do it together and as i said it started off with a big group of course like 50 but by the time we get down to the three actors our chorus has shrunk shrunk sorry to 12 to 15 people so you would have about 15 to 18 people performing plays now in Greek society, only citizens could perform theater, and men were the only ones eligible for citizenship. So a woman was not considered a citizen, so therefore she could not be an actor in the Greek theater. Now there is women characters in the Greek theater, and that's where we kind of like talk about um, the Greeks... The Greeks were very known for their masks, and we'll talk about a little bit more about it in a second. You better understand, I'm going to put a link um, in the description of this link from Flushed Away. The Flushed Away is a cartoon, and it's not Greek, but I wanted to show you the example of what a course kind of can do in cartoons. So, Flushed Away has slugs, and they kind of help set the mood and kind of like really do what a kind of a Greek course did in that show. So, I will put that in the link below. All right, so Greek theater standards. So these are things the, like, this is how and what Greek theater was. So, again, we talked about only men because they're citizens. And then masks for multiple character. You're going, you see in the picture, you can see this guy has a mask on his face. Um, the, each actor had a mask. So, and most of the times, if they, like I said, there's only three actors, but there's, like, 15 roles they have to play and each of them have five they have to change quickly and it's you don't have time to change your costume and hair and makeup so they would have masks and they would just change out they also did a lot of chanting their dialogue it was much more poetic and especially the chorus was more musical almost or and then it also had a lot of stylized dance and codified gestures codified gestures are like big movements that like represent something the greeks the greeks were very presentational that means it's not to represent real life this is very like this is theater for sure this is not real and like it's very like this is representing this it's not like you're trying to convince people that this is all right, codified gestures. I was sort of trying to talk about a second ago. So this is where an actor uses a specific set of body movements to communicate a particular meaning to an audience. So I know it may be kind of hard to see, but you can see right here we've got three people with the big gesture. So 
the first one is surprise. It's that, like, arms out, like, shocked kind of thing. Like, you throw your arms out real big out to the side, and that would mean surprise. Appeal, or to appeal to someone. You see how they're down, the, set, the middle one, they're down on their knees with their hands up towards the sky, or to the person they're appealing, um, and etc. And see how these are very big gestures. That's what a codified gesture is. All right, so now we're going to talk about the actual structure of their plays, the Greek plays. So this is the tragic structure. It is sort of like the structure we've seen before in our dramatic structure that we currently have, but it's a little, it is a little different. So first is the prologue. This is an introduction. It sets the scene, which should sound very kind of similar to exposition. Then we have the Peridos, and this also should sound familiar as well because the core, we use Peridos as well in the physical structure of the Greek theater. Peridos is uh, when the chorus comes on to the stage, sh either singing, chanting, speaking, dancing, whatever. That's when we get our introduction of our chorus and they kind of help further the story along. Then we have what is known as an episode. Now, you will have multiple episodes in Stasimon, the thing, other thing I'm about to talk about, but let's talk about them specifically. Episodes. So, it's a dramatic scene. It's a scene that's happening. So, we have our intro, our chorus comes in, it's upping the stakes, and then we get our, like, a uh, dramatic scene, a scene that furthers the story along. Then that is followed by the Stasimon, which is the chorus talking about what just happened and what could happen in the next scene. So, like, say someone's, like, in this episode, you have a man and a woman, and he's um, talking about running away together, and she's not sure. And then the stasimon of that scene, the chorus would say, would talk about what happened, like, oh, he wants to run away with her, what should we do, and then, or what should she do, and, like, or maybe she shouldn't run away, you know, so they say something like that to help for the scene. So then you'll have another episode in Stasmont. You'll have a couple of those. And then, finally, you will have your exodus, which is like your conclusion. So it's like our um, denouement, our resolution, it happens. And then exit everybody. Um, so the best example of kind of like an easy way to think about it is through Disney's Hercules. At the very beginning, we have the prologue with the women talking about, like, who Zeus was and who the Titans were. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna click on these. I will le have a, in the playlist with this video, in the Greek theater playlist, these videos will be there so you can watch them to better understand them. So, you have the course there. Oh, and you can see it. But unfortunately, like, an episode, eh, an example of an episode for, like, Hercules is when he, in the Dizzy Hercules, he uh, has to try and kill this, like, being, this monster, and he keeps slicing its head off. And they people think he dies, but he doesn't. And then the Stasmon after that is the song Zero to Hero that the chorus sings about how he went from no one, and then after he killed that monster, now he's someone, and he's, like, killing all the monsters, and they kind of help push the story along between the next episode. Then later, we have our exodus. At the very end, Hercules becomes a god, but because he loves Meg, he wants to stay on Earth with her. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Alright, so, um, if you look at this chart, this looks familiar, should look familiar from our dramatic, your dramatic, your basic dramatic structure. So, um, the only difference is that if you actually pull this out to a full-length Greek play, you would have multiple peaks. So, prologue, we're introducing what's going on, we get that chorus intro, we have an episode where we something happens, then we have a stasimon where our chorus talks about it, and you probably have a couple more of those, and then finally you have your resolution, your exodus. Well, guys, that has been a very brief intro to Greek theater history. I hope you've learned something. 
Well, Drama Llamas, I hope you learned a lot. What I would suggest you do if you want to learn more about Greek theater is read a very important Greek play called Oedipus Rex. It is a great example of this time period. You can also find versions of it on YouTube for free. All right, guys, I will see you next time. Later, llamas.